Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So today, for the first time, you're going to talk about a qualitative research paper. Uh, you will shortly hear all about it. We are sorry that after teasing you for a bit, we were not able to uh, bring you uh, Professor Wilde's um, talk on uh, mixed methods research. This was due to a technical issue. We will uh, make sure we reschedule this session uh, for the next few months. Uh, we will be having a little bit of a chat about uh, qualitative research and uh, philosophy of science after the um, paper presentation and I have uh, left it there for you to uh, listen to as it brings up a couple of very interesting points. Stay tuned for more special guest sessions. We will have Professor Rosins from uh, Tel Aviv in uh, July, and now I'll leave you to the paper. We are going to talk about um, a paper slightly different from usual. Uh, it's the first time we talk about a qualitative um, research paper, and it's the first time, uh, for whatever reason, that we talk about a COVID-19 paper as well. So two firsts uh, for tonight. Um, so um, as you can see from the title, um, this is a qualitative study exploring how surgical teams mitigated the risks of uh, COVID-19 uh, in the early phases of the pandemic. Um, it comes from a mixture of researchers from Bristol, um, some from Cambridge and some from Leeds as well, and is published in uh, BMJ Open just this month. Uh, so Maria is going to tell us a little bit more about the background uh, for this paper. Hi guys, I'm Maria. So COVID-19, obviously everyone knows unfortunately what that is. However, it was something that was on the news and then all of a sudden it was all around us in many ways. Uh, there was no time for research and things had to be put in place very quickly um, with very different circumstances evolving around everyone. Operating theatres are high risk places anyway in their nature. However, there were many other risks involved when it came to COVID-19, such as social distancing. Uh, you can't social distance from your patients as a surgeon. You can't social distance from your your team, your scrub nurses, your assistant, and also there's aerosol generating procedures in theatre. And obviously that also puts a lot of people at risk who are working in theatres in a multidisciplinary environment. Um, so there were also many different managers involved in making protocols, which meant that as you know, frontline staff, we had to deal with, well, my nursing manager says this and my ODP manager says this. So in many ways, there were too many cooks spoil the broth. I think we, we had to make sure that multiple people were happy and coming up with one guideline. Um, so it was also a time where people were worried about taking the virus home, which is something that before COVID-19 was something that I didn't really think about before I went to work every day, but that suddenly became a big issue uh, when COVID came. Uh, so, and also this paper is in what way people are making sense of what's happening around them. So back to Gio. Yeah, so uh, thanks Maria. Um, in, in this context, the aim of this paper was basically exploring surgical teams' experiences of current practices during the pandemic uh, and understand two things, how they perceive the risk of COVID-19 in surgery and the word perceived here is very important uh, as we will see um, because of the stages of the pandemic where this paper was um, sort of generated and how they mitigated the, uh, the risks that they perceived were there. Um, just a brief uh, highlight of the qualitative methods that uh, are applied to this paper. Now, um, uh, the authors use semi-structured interviews uh, and the variety of methodologies are there about um, interviews and how to conduct them. Uh, they are recorded and transcribed Authors then uh, and researchers go through the transcriptions of the interviews and identify codes. Now, uh, this is a definition of uh, coding. Um, 
it comes from Gibbs. Gibbs is a big name in qualitative research and in medical education research as well. And basically, coding is a way of going through a text and indexing and categorizing it in order to define a framework of themes or ideas that are coming out of it. The authors then go through uh, the transcriptions again and the recordings were necessary and identify a variety of themes with a comparison and a contrast approach. So basically they identify a set of themes that are in the background and potential uh, contrasting uh, themes that are emerging in order to highlight even opinions that are um, relatively uh, little represented in the population. Overall, this is a very good example of grounded theory. So it, basically, uh, your theories and your information comes directly from the data. Uh, you are not approaching uh, your research starting from an assumption. You let the data drive you to your conclusions. Uh, and Maria is going to go through this methodology in a little bit more details, particularly in as app applied to this paper. So just wanted to highlight, thanks Gio, first of all, this, this paper was the interviews were conducted between March and May 2020, which was during the first wave of the pandemic. So this is a qualitative study, so it's a little bit different to how, I, how I've conducted studies in the past and also how I've read papers before. So it's a few things to get around, if that makes sense. So they sort of used a, a key informant to sort of do their interviews, which means that they asked people who they thought were either representative of a group of people so that they could sort of broaden um, how sort of broaden the ideas they were getting if that makes sense they used a snowball sampling which is where you sort of just ask your friends to do the study or the people you work with and then they suggest other people um who would be good to do the study and that in a sense is how a snowball grows as it rolls down a hill it just sort of recruits snow as it goes along so that's why it's called snowballing However, the people that were conducting the interviews had quite an open script, open-ended questions, but they did have a script that they followed. And they used reflectivity, which is where they sort of think about how they're asking the questions and make their own reflective notes as they go along. And then they can change the way they're asking the questions if they feel they need to. Um, so they can change and alter the interviews as they're going along, um, which, has its own benefits, I suppose. However, they focused mainly on the risk that people were feeling, um, both for themselves and for other people. So when we're talking about others, that's for their colleagues and also the patients as well. But this wasn't a patient, a patient uh, experience or anything. This was just about healthcare professionals in this survey that they did. So back to Geo. All right, so let's start digging into the results. So as you can see, they had 43 participants in total. And as you can see from this diagram, the distribution of people involved was quite, you would say, uneven. There were 34 surgeons, five anesthetists, and four nurses. But let's have a look at what type of surgeons and what type of nurses they managed to recruit. The vast majority of surgeons involved were general surgeons. I guess we are reasonably easy to come by. Uh, followed by ENT surgeons. Um, Pretty relevant group in this context, because obviously they are exposed to uh, AGPs all the time. There were five neurosurgeons, two cardiothoracic surgeons, and a lone ophthalmologist uh, contributing to this um, research. Um, I draw here a list of the nursing uh, sort of practitioners that were involved in the study. And as you can see, there's one practice educator, one nurse manager, one matron, one charge nurse. So the vast majority of people in this group are actually quite far away, in my views, from the daily activities of theatres, though they might very well be involved in uh, policy drawing and, uh, and design. Uh, so ball to you, Maria. Thanks, Gio. So this world map just illustrates where people um, were recruited from. So mostly you can see it from the UK. However, they did state that they wanted to have opinions from other healthcare professionals who were ahead of the curve when it comes to COVID-19. So that's places like China and Italy and Spain who are probably ahead of us. So that's why you see they're recruited there. Thanks, Joe. back to you. Marvellous. So um, the uh, authors overall identified five main themes uh, or codes, I guess. Um, facing new and uncertain risks, changes to the context of surgery due to COVID-19, innovations within high-risk specialties, 
uh, are result generating procedures, uh, their complexity and uh, risks associated with it and the uncertainty related to those risks. And obviously adapting to PPE related challenges, which I am sure everyone in the audience have uh, suffered from. So we'll briefly go through these uh, five themes, bearing in mind that this, what we're gonna tell you is our interpretation of the paper itself. And if you want a first-hand account, um, including key uh, quotes from the interviews, you should go through the paper itself. So ball to you, Maria. Thanks, Gio. So the impact on what procedures are performed, there was a lot of issues around people being able to secure PPE. So a lot of elective procedures were canceled, not just for the, ri the risk, was more to do with the risk of not having PPE as well. Um, so that needs just to be highlighted there. And that's more of a governmental issue. And um, there was less coming through the door. So there was less operating in that way. However, there was a lot of anxiety about catching COVID-19, both from frontline workers and also from the general public, which probably dissuaded people from coming through the door and obviously there were risks to themselves and risks to others so this is something that we didn't have to deal with before so that was definitely something that was highlighted when um, people were discussing it in these interviews. Um, so back to Gio. Marvellous. So another very important point was related to changes to the context of surgery. Now the participants highlighted how theatre pathways were changing quite often, and I'm sure you all remember from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, pathways were changing on a weekly basis or uh, if not even uh, more often. And a lot of participants felt that ongoing team discussion was an essential component of changes or altering or updating these pathways. And a lot of stress was generated by working with a very limited amount of evidence. Um, some of, uh, I believe it was an anaesthetist that mentioned this uh, in the paper, um, mentioned the possibility of uh, using new uh, techniques and innovating in a sort of uh, very fast and very improvised way. And they called it the MacGyver effect, which I've actually looked into and is a thing that has been described in uh, uh, the um, cognitive sciences literature. Um, obviously, when you start doing things like that, uh, sometimes it works out, but most of the time it actually doesn't. And that seemed to be the main feeling from uh, the um, participants uh, in this study. So both to you, Maria. Thank you, Gio. So the, the high risk specialties that were identified were ENT, max flux and anesthetics particularly. Unfortunately, the first um, the first death from COVID-19 on the front line was actually an ENT surgeon. Um, so I think that the community of ENT surgeons felt, felt that they needed to step up. So they did things like turned off ventilators to decrease the amount of secretions for a period of time before they started doing tracheotomy procedures. And also both in anesthetics and ENT max facts, they sort of prevented their trainees from doing certain procedures such as tracheostomies or intubations not because they didn't want the trainees to do them, but it was more to do with the fact that they wanted the most skilled person to do the procedure, to one, decrease the amount of time that was taken to do the procedure and also to decrease risk to everyone else in the room, because obviously the more time you have an aerosol generating uh, procedure going on for them, I suppose the higher the risk is. So I know that was a thing that was going on. In anaesthetics, they also changed the mode of the way that the anaesthetic was given. So they do more local or regional blocks and maybe, um, I suppose, dissuading people from having operations if they didn't need them, maybe. Things such as uh, putting people to sleep was done in theatres, not in the anaesthetic room. And they had the 10 minute downtime where just the anaesthetist and ODP were present in theatre. Um, and try to decrease the amount of aerialization that was happening. Uh, so people used full PPE, smoke and filter evaporators. Um, there was mention in the paper as well of using plastic drapes over patient spaces when they were anaesthetized to decrease the amount of aerosol generating particles that were getting through. And small things like writing their names on the top of PPE because there was no name badges were also mentioned, just little things to try and help yeah so uh, back to geo for the results right so uh further point agps 
uh, complexity associated with them uh, and uncertainty associated with the risks of performing one. Uh, now, uh, a fairly basic question that I think we all asked ourselves at the beginning of the pandemic was what is an, a an AGP? Now, certain things are quite obvious, like, I don't know, endotracheal intubation, but uh, NG tube insertion uh, went in and out of the list a couple of times, uh, as well as transnasal uh, endoscopy uh, for upper GI purposes, for example. Um, so a lot of recommendations changed throughout the first phases of the pandemic, and that obviously generated a lot of, of distress. Um, a lot of surgeons mentioned uh, the urgency or the need of interfacing with the community. So basically finding out what other hospitals were doing. And I'm sure we all experienced this firsthand. Um, a lot of um, our consultants um, in other still at least still discuss um, opinions that they received from a variety of tertiary centers when deciding what to do. Uh, for example, in doing laparoscopic appendicectomies, yes or no. Um, and obviously, whenever you're performing an AGP, especially if you're not entirely sure how you're supposed to protect yourself, um, you feel the risk of putting yourself uh, in contact with COVID and obviously putting your family in contact with COVID. Um, Bolt to you, Maria. Thanks, Gio. Um, so obviously the way we use PPE uh, in before COVID was quite blasé, I think. We didn't really know how to Donald off and these were terms that were thrown at us very quickly. Um, so I think we all had to adapt to the use of PPE and also when there wasn't adequate PPE, what to do then when we had issues with that. So I think there was a lot of tension between the government and ourselves and also a, a bit of anger as well. And I think this was all things that probably in a qualitative study probably come out a bit more than maybe in a quantitative study. Um, but, you know, they're all important points to make as well. Uh, so back to Geo, because we're going to, oh, I think it's me actually, sorry, Geo. We're going to talk about the limitations. So the limitations in this study was the sampling, I feel. It was this snowball falling effect, which I don't think was great. It was also just to mention it was 77% male, which is, you know, it's fine, but um, they want, they stated in the paper they wanted to make it equal. Um, the, there weren't really the, the right number of nurses I don't feel in this study and also there were no ADPs in the study and they're quite a large part of our MDT within theatres. Um, they talk about the social desirability bias so this is where people when they send out a survey and then the people that respond to the survey they sometimes think about what the people that send the survey out want to want to hear so sometimes things are overly, you know, the good things are overly reported and the bad, the bad things not so much reported, if that makes sense. Um, so that can be quite difficult as well. Um, and also the interviewing period was probably some of it, some people may say a bit premature for our peak um, in here in the UK, because uh, in March, 2020, I don't think we were experiencing the peak as much as they were in Italy or China or Spain. Uh, so we're just going to talk, Gio's going to talk you through the others. Yeah, uh, so uh, as you can see, we reiterated again, is the sample representative? Uh, I think this, obviously the authors do mention it, but I think there are a few issues that they don't highlight very well. Um, the vast majority of people in interviewed were obviously um, surgeons or anesthetists. Um, so they do sort of have a position of uh, power and responsibility in the operating theatres. And I suspect uh, with involvement of a, a certain number of ODPs or, or people that do hierarchically have a different position in the operating theaters, uh, even um, simply trainees, uh, you would probably have a very different view. And if any of the recent theories about motivation um, is true, I suspect a lot of the social desirability that we have seen coming from surgeons probably would not be um, as evident uh, in interviewing um, other people. Um, response rate, they mentioned that they have nine people that declined and I suspect this is from direct requests from the interviewing group. And I think that this is uh, obviously an underestimate, um, A, because you can't really track snowballing and B, because they also use the Royal College of Surgeons platform to advertise this 
uh, initiative and uh, you don't know how many people you've reached there. So their dropout rate is actually much higher. And there is a language issue that they don't tackle at all. Um, I am not entirely sure uh, if um, the number of people that they recruited in Italy or Spain uh, or China, for example, is related to the fact that there was a language barrier and therefore the sample could not be as representative. So to wrap this up, basically the two main themes that emerged from this um, qualitative study are that communication and teamwork played an integral role uh, in how teams adapted to the challenges of COVID-19. And while there were a lot of guidelines out there that were published very quickly, the perception of the risks um, associated with COVID-19 and AGPs were very complex and very much context dependent. And I just want to say one thing from this table down at the bottom. I think that the main limitation of this study is um, poor sampling, but the methods that they use in conducting their interviews and going through the interviews felt to me very rigorous. And uh, this is the end for us. Right, in the next uh, a couple of minutes, I'll try and give you a rundown of the discussion we had after the paper presentation. A very few interesting points emerged that are uh, worth mentioning. So let's start uh, with a very relevant uh, and uh, very simple question. Uh, what is the um, external validity um, of uh, a paper like this? The concept of external validity um, applies relatively to uh, qualitative research. As mentioned during the paper presentation, the researchers here use grounded theory, which basically means that researchers start their approach to the problem from a constructivist perspective, and they are not seeking a mathematical truth, but they are rather letting the data drive their conclusions. There's a lot to say about the philosophical approach that uh, people have to research, and I have to say so far in CRAM search we have uh, perhaps taken a post-positivistic approach, mostly, uh, focusing on the data and the methodology around the data, which is definitely a relevant part of research, but a part of it. I uh, can pretend to give you a round down of philosophy of science in uh, a couple of minutes, so I will put in the show notes a link to a, a podcast uh, from Lara Varpio, a PhD professor uh, in the States. And in about 20, 25 minutes, she will give you a rundown and a primer of philosophy of science and the core differences between a positivistic, post-positivistic and constructivist approach to science. So to cut the long story short and answer the original question, uh, external validity doesn't really apply to um, this type of research. To a certain extent, qualitative research does have transferability, uh, provided that the sample was um, adequately uh, constructed and collected. However, that's not always the case. Uh, a further important point from debate that emerged was related to whether we feel that um, qualitative research um, has a space uh, in surgery uh, and how likely it is going to become a big part of uh, what we do on a daily basis in the future. So my take on this um, is that qualitative research does have a space in surgery, obviously. And I feel uh, personally that the best examples of qualitative research that I come across are related to the use of such technique as complementary to quantitative data. And I think a brilliant example of this um, was the uh, LACES trial, which uh, we presented a few episodes back. By the uh, authors used uh, qualitative techniques to identify uh, acceptability and potential barriers in conducting the randomized clinical trial itself and issues that emerge from the perspective of both participants uh, and researchers associated with the trial. I personally think that qualitative research on its own uh, does obviously have a space in surgery. However, I think that its lack of generalizability and often lack of transferability does 
uh, limit its applications to a certain extent. But this is just my view of it. And it's perhaps limited by the fact that I personally have never conducted qualitative research um, as a standalone project. Can I give a different, different viewpoint? Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. I think there is there is lots and lots of room for qualitative and mixed methods uh, research. I'm just coming out of the back end of an MD, which was um, mixed methods research with with Prof Prof Wild, and I think the problem is it's really hard to understand and get your head around it because we've been fed numbers, p values, all these kind of things which we're told are really important, but actually it only answers part of the question. Whereas this sort of explorative kind of data backed up by um, questionnaires and other things gives a very different, um, rich uh, data, which is more humanistic and um, presents something quite different. And in particular, particularly sort of patient um, involvement and patient participation being so important in research these days, I think it's going to it's it's a definitely a growth area. Um, and I think it is something which is, is really interesting and, and you'll probably see a lot more of coming going forward. But I think at the moment, it's still quite difficult to publish. Uh, papers are generally much longer. If you look at the word count for this paper, it's much, much longer because you've got all the quotes and all that kind of rich, rich data, but people just aren't used to seeing it and reading it. And it is harder, but it, it does add a richness and a tapestry um, to... Um, and understanding a problem in a different sort of way, um, using qualitative, quantitative, and different methodologies together, I think is it, it really adds um, adds to the literature and understanding a topic in a much deeper sense. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>